Hi, this is Ted Balaker with Reason TV. Today I'm at the Peterson Automotive Museum in Los Angeles, California, and I'll be sitting down with political satirist and author P.J. O'Rourke. His latest book is Driving Like Crazy, 30 Years of Vehicular Hellbending. Stick around and hear O'Rourke's take on bailouts, easy women, and who ruined the U.S. auto industry. The automobile, although it's seen as you know the source of all this bad stuff, uh, it does produce a lot of wealth for a lot of people. The, the automobile world. is the source of no bad stuff in America. There wouldn't be an America without an automobile. We are a huge country. And we, you know, the, the, this country just didn't come together as a nation until the car was invented because of basically transport problems. We would be a kind of, we'd be Australia if it weren't for the car, you know. No offense to Australia, it's a nice enough country, but it's too many, too few people in too huge a space. It just never came together as a, a, as a real nation. You talk a lot about the uh, American love affair with the automobile. Do you think that's been replaced with a love affair with trains in the form of rail transit, light rail? Yes, there's something romantic about the train, but, like, try, but try getting the tracks to come to your house. I mean, when it comes time to unload the groceries, the romance with the train disappears <laughs> immediately. Well, maybe it's more than the, the politicians love affair with the politicians train. Love, po why do politicians love trains? Because they can tell where the tracks go. They know where everybody's going. I mean, politicians, it's all about control. It is all about power. Politics itself is nothing but an attempt to achieve power and prestige without merit. That is the definition of politics. Politicians hate cars. They've always hated cars because cars are, make people free. Not only free in the sense that they can go anywhere they want, which is bugs politicians in the first place, but they can move out of the political district that the politician represents. So if it is mostly the politicians who are in love with the trains, in that vein, I want to show you a little something from a book called Transport of Delight by Jonathan Richmond. This goes back to 1991 when here in Los Angeles they opened up their very first uh, rail transit line, the Blue Line, and they decided to open it on Valentine's Day Aww. because, of course, you know, again, America the love affair. Loves and I just want you to take a look at how it was announced. A tunnel just waiting for a train, a heart shaped tunnel, a tunnel just like, calling Dr. Freud. <laughs> <laughs> Does it bother you when you hear uh, new urbanists and, and others talk? It's a, it's a, fam a favorite refrain of journalists that we're addicted to our automobiles. I, like it doesn't bother me. I want to strangle them. It's a little bit beyond bother, you know? I want to stuff them in their Prius and lock the doors is what I want to do, you know? They just don't know what they're talking about. Um, Americans uh, were able to create the life that we have in America by being able to get out of the big cities. It was the corruption of the urban political machines, lousy public schools, uh, insane municipal bureaucracies. We, the reason we live in the suburbs is because we were able to escape those things. And the reason we were able to escape those things, it wasn't the train, it was the car that allowed us to get far enough away from that stuff to build a decent life. And now with that, uh Fast forward to GM and so many people calling it government motors these days and the typical yeah. scattershot way of government. We're, we're hearing about all their new goals, cleaner, greener. Um, somewhere on the list is making cars that people want to buy. Somewhere what, way down on the list because if you want to see a government-owned automobile, go get an East German Trabant. That's the kind of cars the government makes. You know, it, It's going to be garbage. And of course it's garbage from a number of points of view. The, 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 the success of capitalism has everything to do with failure. I mean, people talk about the wealth that capitalism creates, but the poverty that capitalism creates in capitalists, not in poor people, is also extremely important. When a business fails, it's time for a business. There's a reason for the business failing. They're making a product nobody wants to buy. You don't come in there and save that product. The Obama administration has got this economic uh, thing, which is if it's, if it's working, tax the hell out of it. If it's not working, bail it out. And if it's just scraping by, drop Barney Frank on it till it screams for help. You know? This is ins an insane approach. So there's been a lot of Monday morning uh, quarterbacking about what went wrong with the U.S. auto industry. What, in your estimation, went wrong? Well, I think several things happened. Uh, one was uh, government uh, regulation. Uh, the government regulation, uh, uh, in, uh, particularly in the post-1973, after the first Arab oil embargo, the imposition on automobiles of uh, cafe standards, of fuel standards, 
of, uh, of emission standards, of endless safety standards. All these things were very bad for the car. They made the car more complex, less elegant, uglier in the case of five mile an hour bumpers. This, they, they, they worked on spoiling the American love affair w w with the car. There was also a lot of mandated uh, 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 technology involved here. The government wasn't satisfied in saying, look, you know, the cars are making the air dirty. Can you guys make the cars cleaner? They wanted to tell them how to make the cars cleaner. Well, these people don't know it, but the, the politicians don't know anything about engineering. So the situation was very much like, okay, dad burns dinner. So we get the dog to cook. You know, we find the one person who knows, you know, the creature who knows even less about the subject, and we put him in charge. You know? so, so there was that problem. Uh, and also there was the problem of, 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 of volatility. Uh, it takes a long time to design and produce an automobile, four years, five years, to get an automobile through from, the, from its conception stage to it actually rolling off the production line. Um, cars companies have always faced the problem of volatility of consumer demand. After all, the great bulk of autom American automobile companies have failed and not been bailed out. Where was the and government? we're still here. Right? We're still here. <laughs> People yeah. still where, have jobs. Where How was did that the, happen? Yeah, where was the government with Studebaker? Where was the government with Packard? Where were they with Hudson? Where were they with Nash? You know, where were they with Crosley's? You know, never mind. But anyway, a lot of car companies have failed over the years due to one type of volatility, volatility of consumer demand. Very scary. But if you add to that volatility in commodity prices, see car companies for most of the hundred years that cars have been around have been able to, to uh, uh, predict with reasonable accuracy, uh, exception for World War II maybe, what gasoline was going to cost and what the iron and steel and stuff that goes into an automobile. Starting with the 70s, you get into a period of volatility uh, where car companies are forced to design cars that are going to come out in five years. Not only don't they know what the public is going to want in five years, but they also don't know what th the stuff that the car is made out of is going to cost. If you add on to that the third kind of volatility, the real crime of government intervention in automobiles, not any specific thing that they ask for. Cleaner air is good, using less gas, that's probably good. Even five mile an hour bumpers and safety standards, all this is good. But you couldn't tell what the government was going to ask for next. So you get regulatory volatility. So all of a sudden, car companies are facing three kinds of volatility instead of just one kind of volatility. From Chevy to Ford, you see a lot of uh, conflating the purchase of an American car with patriotism. Do you think it's patriotic to buy an American car? Of course not. First place, mostly, most American cars aren't actually American cars. I mean, the parts come from all over the place. It, it, the car itself may have been assembled in Canada or Mexico. There's no such thing as an American car. All cars are international cars now. On the other hand, the Toyota you, you buy, uh, may be made in the United States. The Honda you buy definitely will be made in the United States. The BMW you buy will be made in the United States. The Volkswagens too. So you don't know whether you're buying an American car. Now just buy a good car. Buy the car that you want.